Asus sent over to me their 2023 Tough A16 AMD Advantage Edition to check out. This is also a 2023 Tough A16 AMD Advantage Edition, but this is not the same as this. Nope, one of them has AMD's last gen Ryzen 7 processor, while the other is kitted with a current gen Ryzen 9 processor. It gets a little bit more complicated though than just, you know, processor differences and power differences. And there's actually very important information that you should know about if you are considering getting any one of these laptops. Yeah, you're gonna want to really stick through this video. So let's get into it. Right, so yes, while they're both tough laptops, both A16s, both AMD Advantage Editions, and both made in the same year, they at least carry different model numbers to tell them apart. The Zen 3 Plus model is the FA617NS, while the Zen 4 model is the FA617XS. I'll be referring to them as the Zen 3 and Zen 4 models moving forward. The Zen 3 Plus, uh, FA617NS, gets the 8-core, uh, 16-thread Rembrandt, 7735HS, while the Zen 4 FA617XS gets the 8-core, 16-thread Phoenix, 7940HS. Changes in the CPU also mean changes in the iGPU, with the Zen 3 Plus getting a Radeon 680M and the Zen 4 a Radeon 780M. They both rock the same Radeon 7600S with 8GB of VRAM, which should be uh, pretty potent for gaming. One unfortunate dissimilarity is the starting RAM for both laptops, with the Zen 3 Plus model starting at 8GB and the Zen 4 at 16GB of DDR5 4800, which, to no surprise, 8GB can be a bit of a problem. More on that later. The SSD is also smaller at 512GB versus 1TB, although both are Micron 2400s. While both laptops use 16-inch screens with 1610 aspect ratios, the Zen 4 model has a higher density 2560 by 1600 screen, while the Zen 3 Plus gets a still good but more standard 1920 by 1200 screen. They both get the same Realtek Wi-Fi 6 chip and a 90 watt hour battery. Physically, they're both pretty much the same laptop, with the dimensions coming in at 354 by 252 by 30 millimeters at its thickest of the table. Surprisingly, though, they're not exactly similar in terms of weight, but the discrepancy is so small at just shy of 60 grams that you're probably not going to notice it. Uh, still, it'd be interesting to see if we spot any other differences once we get inside. Interestingly as well, these laptops come with not one but two power bricks, which I find really cool because, you know, you get the standard 240 watt power brick that weighs in at 762 grams that you can leave at home and when you're on the move, carry with you the lighter and smaller, albeit less powerful USB-C PD brick, which does a respectable 100 watts and weighs at, you know, 412 grams. The models that I was sent come with this sandstone finish which I low-key kinda like as it looks different from the other gaming laptops out there, you know, the uh, tan beige and black colours make it kinda reminiscent of an FN scar if you know your guns. Only the top lid is made of metal with the insides being matte black plastic which while normally makes it very prone to fingerprint oils and stains, I didn't find it too particularly bad this time around. Both laptops also have the same set of ports, so a 3.5mm combo jack, USB 3.05GB per second port, two USB Type-C ports, one regular 10GB per second while the other is USB 4 with DisplayPort support that you can also use to charge the laptop from, a HDMI 2.1, an Ethernet port and a barrel charging port on the left. The right is a little bit more lonely as it has only the uh, second USB 3.05GB per second port. The bottom is where you'll find a bunch of intake vents and the holes for the bottom firing speakers and for whatever reason, the middle of the laptop has this cute little triangular orange rubber feet. Yeah, opening both laptops starts off pretty easy. Just, you know, pick up your Phillips head one screwdriver and get cracking on the 12 screws holding the bottom panel on. It's prying off the panel, that's not that easy. The bottom panel is held on very securely via clips, so removing them requires a bit of help from a plastic spudger and slowly working around the chassis. Internally, both laptops look identical, which is fine and all, but it doesn't explain why the Zen 3 variant is heavier even with one less stick of RAM than the Zen 4 variant. 
I, I don't know. Uh, I can't explain it. I don't have an answer for it. So if you guys know what's going on, feel free to leave a comment down below. Otherwise, they get the uh, same five heat pipes, the same two fans, although from different brands, and the same amount of RAM slots at two and storage with an additional MT1 over on the right. The lid can be opened easily with one hand easily passing the test, but it doesn't really extend that far down. And yes, as mentioned before, while both screens are 16 inches, they do carry different resolutions with one being 2560 by 1600 and the other 1920 by 1200 with the Zen 4 model getting the more pixel dense screen. That's not all where they differ though. Uh, the screen on the Zen 4 A16 is more color accurate with a 100% DCI-P3 color accuracy while the Zen 3 A16 only reaches up to 75.35% Adobe sRGB. Uh, the Zen 4 has a faster refresh rate at 240Hz versus 165Hz, a faster response time at 3 milliseconds versus 7 milliseconds. But to me, the biggest thing that I noticed was just the difference in maximum brightness on both both screens. The 1600p screen on the Zen 4 A16 hits a maximum of 600 lux, which makes it perfectly usable even in a really bright room, whereas I struggle to read anything on the 1200p screen on the Zen 3 A16 in a sunlit room as its maximum brightness only topped off at about half in comparison at just about 300 lux. Where it does win though is usage in a pitch black room as the 30 lux max on the Zen 4 A16 meant that it was still a little bit uncomfortably bright, whereas the Zen 3 A16 could go as low as 10 lux, which felt much better. Not that I condone using your laptops in a dark room. Again, do as I say, not as I do. Webcams. Honestly, I'm actually pretty happy that it even has one. And you know, that era where... Uh, laptop makers and manufacturers not including webcams with their gaming laptops or even laptops in general is long gone. Still, these aren't exactly magnificently great webcams and uh, surprisingly enough, they also carry very different webcams from the looks of it. Like, uh, you can very clearly tell the difference between the a webcam on the Zen 3 and the Zen 4 variant with the Zen 4 variant, in my opinion, looking a lot better. So that's a little bit of a surprise as well, you know, the cost savings doesn't just end with the uh, processor. Now, I don't usually talk about webcam results in post, but I think that it does deserve a bit of talking about, although this has more to do with the encoding differences on both laptops. I use the latest versions of AMD's drivers and OBS to record the footage and the differences between the two didn't just end at video quality and focal length as you saw earlier. The 780M on the Zen 4 A16 supports AV1 hardware encoding while the 680M on the Zen 3 A16 doesn't. But while that may seem like a good thing, in the final recordings that you guys saw, I just used H.264 instead. This is because I ran into issues with AV1 on the 780M initially with errors and crashing which seems to be fixed with an even newer driver version. Even then I found the AV1 video encoding quality to be quite bad in comparison to H.264 even with indistinguishable quality levels with artifacting in something as simple as recording their own adrenaline software. So yeah, I wouldn't exactly recommend using it at least for now until they improve it. Using H.264, the previous drivers caused these weird black and white frames that you may have noticed, but luckily I wasn't able to replicate it on the latest 23.8.1 drivers. Typing on this keyboard is not too bad to be honest. While I still do prefer the more solid feel on the ZenBook 14X, I don't feel that this keyboard is too far from it, um, still allowing me to type pretty fast and accurately on it. I managed to get 111 words per minute. There's no RGB here, only a white backlight, but it looks good and uniform and I don't particularly mind. It adds to the more militaristic aesthetic. One of the other things that I appreciate is the dedicated volume up and down key and the microphone mute button, so no need to fumble with key combinations. Oh, and the uh, armory crate button is here too. 
The touchpad surface is quite nice and smooth with fingers easily able to glide across the surface, but the left and right clicks are a bit on the mushy side which is not a deal breaker, but just a little bit of an annoyance. I am now going to get into the software side of things and a fair bit of warning. This is where things are going to get slightly lengthy because I have quite a number of things that I would like to talk about. I could of course talk about my experiences with both laptops prior to the latest drivers but instead I'm just going to talk about the stuff that you can probably expect as a uh, owner of one of these now. I'm going to start with Smart Access Graphics. Introduced earlier last year as AMD's equivalent to Nvidia's Advanced Optimus, it allows the discrete GPU to directly display onto your laptop screen as opposed to instead first piping it through the built-in GPU, so a built-in buck switch to switch between the two. In theory, it provides better battery life and performance. Now, I like that it switches to the DGPU way faster than Nvidia's Advanced Optimus, but whenever it does so because you're maybe gaming or launching an app that uses the DGPU like OBS or Blender, Smart Access Graphics also ends up forcing some background tasks from the iGPU to the DGPU, meaning that even after you've quit the game, these processors are still utilizing your DGPU causing higher than usual battery drain compared to before you started gaming. Mind you that I've also encountered this same issue with Nvidia's Advanced Optimus, so it's not an AMD specific issue. The only way I know around this is to manually head into the graphics options in Windows and add each one of those processes in, telling Windows to only use the integrated GPU for them, which as you can imagine is extremely tedious and it's like playing whack-a-mole because new processes that are stuck using the DGPU crop up all the time. Having activated smart access graphics also creates a problem with waking up from sleep or sometimes just turning on the laptop where when you close the lid it's just black and then you gotta open and close the lid multiple times before the display returns as per normal but sometimes it just doesn't no matter how long or hard you try and you just have to restart the laptop. Normally, I would have already turned this feature off, but maybe it does bring good performance benefits in games, like, you know, what AMD claims. I did a small 3-run test to measure the differences in Cyberpunk 2077 on 1080p high with no AI upscaling, and indeed, I did record some measurable performance benefits with up to a 4fps extra in Cyberpunk 2077 on the uh, Zen 4 A16 and 2 on the Zen 3 A16, so at at least there's that. After a month of extensive testing with all sorts of drivers, either from ASUS or you know AMD official, to me, I just recommend changing it from smart access graphics to hybrid graphics in the AMD Adrenaline software to save yourself the annoyance and headaches. 2-4 to four FPS just isn't worth it. On to the next issue. The Zen 3 A16 that I have suffers from a very strange issue where sometimes it's able to sleep normally, but sometimes it just can't sleep at all. Instead, flashing its keyboard like this constantly, draining the battery and getting hot if you've got it in your bag. And when you wake it up and instead choose to shut it down, it instead restarts itself? Like what? <laughs> and after the restart, it can properly go to sleep and shut down once more, so that's extremely weird. And I've encountered this issue multiple times on this laptop, so I have no idea what's going on. Again, I think it's related to smart access graphics. And speaking of going to sleep, the Zen 4 A16 in particular has this very bad issue where after sleeping for a couple of minutes, sometimes 3, sometimes 10, it just restarts itself, boots back into Windows, goes to sleep again, and after a bit, restart again in an infinite loop of death. The last one is something I deem unacceptable, and this happened to me a few times already on both laptops, where sometimes if they've been shut down for more than half a day, 
they can't start back up by themselves anymore regardless of how much battery you left on the laptop. The moment I plug the power back in, I effectively jumpstart the laptops and once they're powered on, I can unplug them and as you can see, the batteries on both laptops are far from dead. No amount of BIOS updates, cleaning and reinstalling drivers, formatting these laptops, which I have done, I think, more than five times by now, have been able to fix any of these issues. And when I talked to my ASUS rep about it, he brought it up with ASUS HQ, and they're having the same issues as well. The bright side of it is, of course, that if they can replicate said issues, then it's easier for them to debug and fix them. So, yeah, let's hope that that is coming in soon. That's why reviews like what I'm doing here right now is actually pretty crucial. It's not enough to just benchmark a laptop, you know, report on the numbers and send it back. Extended one month plus reviews allow you to fully evaluate every aspect of the laptop, the good and the bad. These are very real issues that anyone who owns these laptops will go through. Let's finish up software with the pre-installed stuff and you get the usual slew of, you know, stuff like my Asus, Armory Crate, Microsoft Office, and McAfee. Seriously, this AV feels more like bloatware than virus, so I kinda just wish that they didn't have it in. Alright, I'm done, so let's just head into the performance numbers because the numbers are actually pretty impressive. Both laptops carry a Micron 2400 SSD, but the Zen 4 A16 gets a larger 1TB variant versus the 512GB on the Zen 3 A16. Larger also usually means faster speeds, and that's exactly what we see here. 20 Cinebench runs in a row doesn't show us any signs of throttling and gives us a good idea as to the performance differences between the 7735HS and the 7940HS, although both laptops are definitely throttling as they both shoot up to 95 Celsius in about 10 seconds from running the benchmark. Blender is a bit of a strange one though. Tests like Monster and Classroom actually put the 7735HS ahead of the 7940HS with it only losing out in Junk Shop because it has 8GB of RAM that the laptop comes with and this benchmark is quite RAM heavy as well. I am not exactly sure why the 7735HS leads over the 7940HS in both Monster and Classroom but I know that it's not clocks or thermos as both laptops definitely hit that 95 celsius quickly like Cinebench, like in 10 seconds, and the 7735HS was definitely clocked lower than the 7940HS at 4.3GHz maximum versus 4.6GHz. I formatted the laptop multiple times, made sure that they both had the same background processors. I did a total of almost 80 runs each, and it's still the same result. So yeah, I don't know. If you guys have any idea as to why this might be, do let me know in the comments section below. On to gaming, every test was run with Smart Access Graphics enabled. In Cyberpunk 2077 1080p high without any AI upscaling, the 7600S on both laptops scored about 1 FPS from each other, which meant that they were pretty much the same. The 7940HS was however better in 1% lows as it was 8 FPS faster than the 7735HS. I consider this to be a pretty good result, but I honestly expected the Zen 4 model to give a little bit more of an edge to the uh, 7600S, although this just means that the 7735HS is plenty fast enough for games. The Callisto Protocol is an interesting one because at a glance it would look like the Zen 3 A16 is actually performing better than the Zen 4 A16 with a higher average FPS and higher 1% lows, but there's really more to the story. Testing was done at 1080p Ultra with TAA enabled, no AI upscaling, and I noticed that when doing the benchmarks, despite both laptops running the same Radeon 7600S, the Zen 3 model is definitely having a lot of trouble loading those textures in, with one laptop looking perfectly fine, the other with really just muddy, featureless textures because the diffuse and normal maps weren't fully loading. 
this is very reminiscent of GPUs lacking VRAM except that both laptops use the same discrete GPU, so that shouldn't be it. The only other thing that I can really think of is the RAM differences between the laptops with the Zen 4 A16 carrying 16GB and the Zen 3 A16 only with 8 and the 7735HS pretty quickly hitting the maximum physical memory load, but again, I can't be fully certain. Far Cry 6 is a pretty much one-sided story because while the Zen 4 A16 was able to run it just fine, the Zen 3 A16 just couldn't because it just didn't come with enough system RAM out of the box. The game straight crashes the moment I try to run the benchmark on the Zen 3 A16, so yeah, seriously, if the uh, Callisto Protocol's odd behavior and had anything to do with the RAM as well, then together with Far Cry 6, no laptop, especially gaming laptops, should come with 8GB by default. 16GB really needs to be the bare minimum. I think the loudest the laptops ever got was during the gaming sessions, but even then I'd struggle to really even call these laptops loud, at least compared to most other gaming laptops even under turbo mode, which makes me feel like they could have operated the fans a bit faster to combat the high heat load. Despite being a much larger laptop than the two Zenbooks that I reviewed earlier, the speakers on it are actually noticeably softer and uh, it's not as nice. I mean, they're not soft by any stretch of the imagination, they're above average but still nothing all that impressive. Runtimes are certainly the highest that I've ever seen for a gaming laptop, but I kinda expected the Zen 4 variant to perform better given that it's the newer, more supposedly, I don't know, power efficient design. Display refresh rates were set at 60Hz, brightness at about 100 lux, and in my test of watching YouTube, listening to music, surfing, and writing this review up on it, the Zen 3 A16 lasted a pretty impressive 6 hours and 50 minutes, while the Zen 4 A16 came out more than an hour and a half shorter at 5 hours and 19 minutes. This is most likely due to the more power-hungry processor as well as the more pixel-dense screen. Charging times were also different between both laptops. Using the big 240 watt brick, the Zen 4 A16 reached 0 to full in 1 hour and 58 minutes, while the Zen 3 A16 was faster at 1 hour and 45 minutes. When using the smaller, more portable 100 watt USB C charger, the Zen 4 A16 took 2 hours and 58 minutes to reach full, while the Zen 3 A16 took 2 hours and 47 minutes. Let's close things up by starting with pricing for both these laptops. The cheapest that I'm currently seeing the Zen 4 A16 go for is 6,084 ringgit, while the cheapest Zen 3 A16 is 4,864 ringgit with 8 gigabytes of uh, RAM, while the more logical 16 gigabyte costs 5,084 ringgit. So they're not exactly budget or entry level laptops, in my opinion. When I'm reviewing a laptop, I'm not just interested in the benchmark numbers to see how well they perform in games or how well they do in the applications that I use on a daily. I'm also very much interested in the experience of using these laptops as if they were my daily machines. These laptops have issues that I cannot ignore, unfortunately, the biggest one being the uh, repeated rebooting issues on the Zen 4 A16 and just needing to, you know, hot wire power start them to even boot up. While issues which stem from features like Smart Access graphics can be fixed by instead using hybrid graphics, not many people know how to do this. These laptops come with Smart Access graphics enabled by default, and there are also plenty of laptops that exist. Without this, these issues, as, as far as I'm concerned, so yeah, I, I can't give it a free pass either. What I do like about them though is the CPU performance that they bring in. It's really nothing to scoff about and the battery life 
which if you remember from like the uh, Zen books that I looked at earlier, well, these gaming laptops even surpass those in terms of battery life. Should ASUS and AMD manage to fix these issues, then yeah, if you were interested in any of them, then sure, you know, go ahead. But as it stands right now, it is difficult for me to do so, and I, I, I can't recommend something based on uncertainty. All I can say is that wait for these laptops to get fixed before getting them or maybe consider getting something else like maybe even something from with an uh, Nvidia GPU instead as you know as much as I like to support AMD and Radeon it shouldn't be at the expense of the user. It's also really not that hard these days to get a laptop with a 4060 at similar prices or lower. Yeah. That's pretty much going to be it uh, for me from this review. Let's do the uh, usual thing of liking it if you liked it, sharing it, uh, commenting down below on maybe what your experiences are if you own any of these laptops, subscribing if you like to see more of my kind of videos, and yeah. My name is Yang, uh, the Tech Rodent, and I'll see you guys in the next video. And yes, I am a little bit sick. I've got a blocked nose, so that's what you're hearing muffled voice, nasally.